Uh, John asked me to talk about TLS. Um, I'm between you and your lunch, so that's no pressure. Um, I work for Akamai, as John said, and I also work in the IETF. Um, and so I wanted to talk about TLS uh, and what's happening in that world. There's a lot going on, as John said. People are becoming more aware of security all the time. And, and he was promoting this talk uh, on Twitter, as you can see. But I wanted to give a caveat. I'm not a security expert. Please don't call me that. Um, I do drink with them. I do hang out with them, uh, both in the IETF context. Uh, because of the work we do with HTTP, I have to spend a lot of time with security people, sometimes way too much time. And as well as Akamai, we have a lot of great security folks as well. So what I wanted to do today was kind of talk about what I see as the next stuff coming up in TLS and, and in the web security world, focusing mostly on, on the wire stuff. Web security is huge. There's no way I can cover it all in 15 minutes. But just to give people a sense of, of what's kind of coming over the horizon in that world. And, and John said that's OK. So good. So uh, he asked me to do that, what, a couple months ago now. And I thought, OK, 15 minutes, fine. I'll sit around. I'll talk about a few things happening in TLS. Should be fine. What, what's going on in TLS? And then this happened. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Heartbleed. It's a huge topic. Hopefully, all of you have educated yourselves to some degree about what it is and, and what the impacts are. It's, it's pretty big. What I will talk about, oh, and by the way, I'm giving lots of links for people in the talk so you can go off and find out more about things. This is, let me Google that for you. Um, I think it is important just to touch, though, on what's happening in the TLS and OpenSSL community as a result of Heartbleed. Uh, it has caused a lot of discussion in that world, not surprisingly. Um, and, and the things we've kind of learned so far, it is a very complex protocol. We're, we're coming to realize that TLS is too complex. And also, even more dangerous, it, it's a monoculture, effectively. We have OpenSSL. Yes, there are a lot of other implementations of, of TLS, but really something like 80% of the world uses OpenSSL. And the whole idea of standards is, is that you don't have one implementation. You have many implementations. So you get good interoperability and diversity and security, and, and they feed on each other. And we've gone too close to a monoculture in TLS. So there's a lot of discussion on how to improve that. Um, open source isn't magic. Just because it's in the open doesn't mean it's secure. On the other hand, there are people saying, oh, well, if this weren't open source, we wouldn't have this problem, which, of course, is crap. Um, and and for, for, for people who use TLS, who use OpenSSL, I think the, one of the biggest takeaways is, is how we do incident handling is really, really important. We need to think about what happens when our infrastructure is compromised or our key is compromised or whatever. And you need to be able to walk through that process with confidence. Otherwise, you'll be caught in a really bad place. So that's it for Heartbleed. I'll work on other stuff now. Um, when we talk about TLS and what's happening, uh, there's a lot going on right now, as I said. It, it, it's pretty busy. I've kind of categorized what's going on in three different ways. Uh, people are talking about we need more use of TLS, especially on the web. Uh, we need a better trust model, and, and we need more speed. So, so let's go through those. Why would you want more TLS? Um, the most obvious reason is, is what we call in the ITF world Snowdonia. You know, the, the revelations of, of Edward Snowden. Uh, we have, for example, five lovely government departments from around the world. I'm citizens of two of those, yay. Um, which have gone and done something we're calling pervasive monitoring. They're going and collecting large amounts of data off the network and using that for whatever purposes. So the ITF went off and had a discussion about that. We had a workshop in London, what, two months ago now, called Strint, where we got a lot of security folks, a lot of government folks, not these folks, uh, 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 technical folks together and decided, what's the community response to this? And the outcome of that was we, we now have IETF consensus that uh, basically pervasive monitoring is what we consider an attack on the infrastructure. And, and therefore, from a technical perspective, we owe it to our users to defend against that attack. And so the ITF is looking, how do we improve security to the point where pervasive monitoring is no longer possible? However, people have been talking about using more TLS long before Snowden ever came out. Uh, for example, there's a tool you can get uh, a while back now, I think this was 2010, uh, called Firesheep, where it's a little Firefox plugin, and it does something fun. You press a button, and it sniffs your local Wi-Fi, and if someone else is on your local Wi-Fi and they're logged into Facebook or, or Google or whatever, It'll sniff their session tokens. 
and then you can log in as that, that person as of 2010. This is the reason why so many services have gone, one of the big reasons why so many of the services have gone to TLS only over the last few years. Uh, when this came out, yeah, I still worked for Yahoo. And at Yahoo, we did our logins over TLS. So when you went to the login.yahoo.com, it was over TLS. But then you got a cookie, and then and that was your session token authenticating you to Yahoo. And you went to the other websites inside of Yahoo, and that token was exposed in the wire. An attacker like uh, Fire, Fire Sheep in your local coffee shop could then grab your authentication token and impersonate you on the service, which is no good. And so this is another reason why people are talking about how, why we need more TLS. Yet another reason, a couple of years back, Google Street View was caught accidentally uh, collecting Wi-Fi data while they drove around Germany and other places. And that data contained passwords, because again, they weren't encrypted, they were in the clear. And people assumed, well, nobody's gonna sniff my Wi-Fi. Well, they did. And so, <clears throat> the emerging consensus in, in, in the communities I work in is, is that more encryption is a good thing. Uh, more encryption is necessary to protect users from these accidental or purposeful collection of data. And so, how do we enable that? One way that people have talked about enabling that is in HTTP2. Uh, which is the working group that I chair. We're working on the next version of HTTP now, and we're actually getting pretty close to the end. And HTTP2 is based upon Speedy. And in Speedy, you had to use TLS, or you have to use TLS to use Speedy in the implementations. Uh, that was done for a few reasons, both for the security reasons as well as for some interoperability purposes. Uh, we backed away from that in HTTP2. We couldn't require the use of TLS. The, the politics were, frankly, just too bad. There are too many people who wanted to use uh, HTTP2 for things other than the common web browsing use case. However, uh, Firefox and Chrome have said that they're only going to support HTTP2 over TLS. And so they've said, you know, we want to use this new protocol that's faster and, and more featureful and better as a carrot to, to encourage sites to deploy encryption. Uh, you know, if, if you don't support uh, TLS for HTTP2, you're not going to get those browsers using it, which means they'll be slower and, and stuck on the old version. Um, there are some people, especially network operators, who aren't happy about this because they are used to being able to look at what's happening across their networks. And so that's an ongoing discussion that is, is still developing, and we're going to be talking about that more, I'm sure. Um, Part of that discussion is also the notion of having HTTP URIs over TLS. In other words, uh, when you contact a normal HTTP site, it still looks like it's over HTTP. The URL doesn't change. The web security context doesn't change. You don't get a lock icon or anything. But under the covers, the protocol negotiates to use TLS to protect against this pervasive monitoring. Now, that only protects against passive attacks. It doesn't protect against active attacks because there are ways you can force a downgrade or you can swap out the cert. But it does protect against someone who's just gathering inf information passively, like the cases I was talking about before. Um, this is still controversial. Uh, Mozilla Firefox is, is experimenting with this right now, uh, whereas the Chrome guys feel that this kind of cheapens TLS, that it, it confuses people about what security is. So that's an ongoing discussion as well, but we might be seeing more of that too. Talking about a better trust model for TLS. So when you go into your browser, or your operating system, that, that's your trust store. It's, it's a list of certificate authorities that your browser trusts to verify who you're talking to effectively. And, and there are bunches of them. If you go into your, your average Windows or, or Mac laptop, there are a large number of these. This is off of my machine a while back. And, and some of these people, you don't really know who they are. There are companies like AAA Certificate Services, so they can get to the top of the phone book, I guess. Or there are governments, or, or, or indeed the military departments of governments in, in your certificate authority lists. And the way that trust works on the web, any of these parties can issue a certificate that says, I'm that website, or I'm, this certificate's good for that website. And, and in theory, they're run tightly enough, all these certificate authorities, they're run with, with certain practices to guarantee that they verify the identity of who they issue a certificate for, and it's not done incorrectly. But in reality, that doesn't always happen. So there was an incident, which the URL at the bottom here is for, where uh, a CA in Turkey, Turk Trust, uh, issued a certificate for Google, um, presumably because somebody in Turkey wanted to monitor what people were doing on Google in Turkey. 
Um, that's not good. And that was found out, and there was a big hubbub. And, and this has happened a few times. You have these, what they call rogue CAs, which can issue certificates either mistakenly or on purpose because maybe they're under government pressure. And that breaks down the trust model in the web. Not so good. Likewise, uh, another problem is uh, what we call TLS man in the middle, where you can have devices that get in the middle of your TLS connections and actually see the traffic in, in plain text going across them. And they do that because, again, they exploit the trust model. They say, OK, install this certificate authority in your browser if you want to use this network. For example, at, at your workplace, your, your workplace might install a certificate authority so you can contact those servers. The problem is, is that certificate authority can also be used to sign other websites, like Google or Facebook or whatever. And then they can inspect the traffic going through. And this is more common than most people realize. There are commercial products, there's one on the left, and open source products, uh, Squid on the right, which enable this. Uh, they make it very easy to, to do this TLS man in the middle. And uh, there's a good paper, uh, I think sponsored by Dell on the bottom there, the link there, explains what's happening here in detail. Um, so this is a concern because you can't really know who you're talking to if you have this certificate authority installed on your machine. And in some cases, if you talk to the right CA and you get the right kind of certificate uh, installed, uh, or sorry, bought from them, you don't even need to install something on the client machine. For instance, if you're a government or you have access to a somewhat dodgy CA. So what can we do about these problems? Um, there are a couple things in train right now. One is hopefully you've heard of by now called strict transport security. This is an HTTP header which you send once you're over TLS. And it says, basically, this site is only available over HTTPS. Don't allow downgrade attacks to plain HTTP. And also, don't let users click through errors. So a lot of the time, you can tell that there's something funny going on because an error will come up saying that the certificate doesn't, isn't valid or it's expired or, or what have you. This HTTPS says, don't allow the user to click through that. Make it a hard error. And that's kind of a baseline for security. Um, you can also get your, your site preloaded into some browsers with, with uh, this semantic effectively if you have a big website. Another mechanism which is a bit newer is called public key pins. Uh, it's still a draft in, in the IETF. It's, it's starting to be implemented by the browsers. And this allows you to pin specific certificates for your site into the browser. So once a user visits your site, it will remember the certificates and the hashes of those certificates and say, well, if it changes, something funny is going on. There's either a rogue CA or a man in the middle. Don't do it again. Um, there's a couple of caveats here. One is, is there's a great risk of locking your users out of your site. If you pin one certificate into you know, people's browsers, it stays there for a very long time. You don't know you have a max age on it, but the idea is to make it a very big max age. Um, and if you lose your certificate or something goes funny or the machine catches fire and burns down, then you've actually locked those users out of your site for a period of time. It uh, could be a great period of time. Uh, the usual practice is you have two certificates and you pin them both, and there you have a backup certificate you can use, but that's a little expensive sometimes. The other is, is that this technique actually may or may not catch man in the middle attacks. Thank you. Wow. OK, that's quick. Um, because there's a lot of politics between the browsers and when they can and cannot enforce uh, man-in-the-middle uh, uh, detection. And I won't go into too much there now, but it's an evolving thing. Another bigger project is called Certificate Transparency, uh, which is pretty quiet, but it's actually getting some, some real momentum. This is the idea that certificate authorities will be required to, to issue a, a log of all of their activity in a public notary. So they have these public logs. Anybody can set up a log, and the certificate authorities submit their entries to those logs. And they're cryptographically proven. You, you, you can, you know, it says this was issued, at, this particular certificate was issued at this particular time. And what's going to happen is, is that Chrome is going to require this to be done for the EV, for the, you know, the green certificates, pretty soon, uh, probably in about the next year. Uh, and then they can audit whether specific certificates have been seen in those logs or not. And that gives you a mechanism where you can say, well, that CA just issued a certificate for this website, but that website had nothing to do with it. That's a rogue CA or something as funny has gone on there. And, it, and it's a way to tighten up the whole trust system. Um, this is being pushed by a couple of folks at Google, and there's actually a, a fairly broad amount of interest in it now. So it, it, go and read up on this one. 
Finally, uh, more speed. I, I don't have any illustrations of why more speed is important because I hope that's self-evident now. Um, there are two interesting things here. One is there's a new Cypher suite that's coming out uh, called Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305, and I just like the name. Um, and, and the takeaway here is it, it's a new technique for encryption, AEAD. This is where authentication and encryption happen together instead of being separate mechanisms. In, in, in most previous crypto suites, they happen as separate, as, as separate you know, functions, and you have to decide which one to do first, and there's a whole story there. But they, these happen at the same time, and that makes it a lot easier to optimize. So much, in, in fact, that you can opti implement this in roughly maybe a bit more 100 lines of code, which is you know, orders of magnitude smaller than many other crypto suites. Um, and it also makes it really easy to optimize on mobile hardware, which is becoming, of course, more and more important. So you see some graphs on the right where the blue lines are, are Cha Cha 20, Poly 1305, and the green ones are AES, which is a very common to use algorithm right now. And you see without uh, AES acceleration, which mobile devices don't have, desktops do, but mobiles don't, Cha Cha is a lot faster. Um, and it's also constant time, so you don't have to worry about timing attacks, which is a whole class of weirdness you have to worry about in crypto. So this is currently being standardized in the ITF. The big news I've saved for last is, is there's currently work on TLS 1.3. Uh, the TLS working group has just started working on the next version of TLS. Um, and they were chartered to do this pretty much as a direct result of all the discussion around Snowden and what happened there. Uh, the goal is for the working group, they want to encrypt as much of the handshake as possible. Right now when your browser talks to the server, uh, some of the negotiation that happens there is in the clear and they want to hide as much of that as, as, as reasonably possible. Uh, for the performance uh, angle, they want to reduce handshake latency. So right now you can take sometimes two round trips to get the handshake working. They want to get it down to either one or even zero round trips if you visited this, the server before. Uh, we've had extensions that do some things like this and they want to consolidate that into the, into the spec. And finally, to improve the crypto, to uh, uh, pare down the cipher suites, ditching things like compression, maybe ditching the renegotiation, paring down the protocol to make it simpler uh, and hopefully more reliable and secure. Uh, they've started, they're starting really just now. They're just releasing their first drafts. They want to be done by the end of the year. We'll see how far they go. I'll finish up with uh, three links, uh, which if you haven't seen are really interesting. They're not directly related to the contents here. The first one, How's My SSL, shows you how your browser implements SSL. It's actually testing the client rather than the server, which is what a lot of previous tools have done. Second is, uh, is TLSFastJet.com, uh, which is a great site explaining performance issues around TLS and how to optimize that on, on the server side. And finally, BetterCrypto.org uh, is a great guide in terms of making algorithm choices and configuration choices for a lot of things, web servers, as well as things like SSH and other servers as well. It's a really great resource. Uh, that's it. Thank you.